Okay, welcome to College Algebra. How is everyone today? Super well. Hi. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, so then your exams are graded, but not in the grade book yet. Okay, they'll be they'll be put into the grade book probably by like Wednesday night. Because it's a lot of scanning. <laughs> I've got to run it through the document feeder. Uh, good. So any questions before we get to it? Is the final exam going to be cumulative? Yes, the final exam will be cumulative, yes. But it will be, it will be in many ways much like the midterm exam, if that's what your question is. Uh, yes, I, I, um, the, the registrar sets the, the final exam time. I don't, honestly, you should look it up, but my memory is saying December 10, and I think that's a Saturday. Yeah, not, well, I, yeah. I'd like to point out that that is, was not my choice, okay? But what, what, what actually happens <coughs> is that instructors inform the registrar that they need, an, they need an exam for so many students and then the registrar does a computation and, and that's, it's on Saturday. <laughs> okay. Sorry? I don't know. Do, I mean, do they normally like after no, I think it's, I think if someone can check on their phone, I think it's like at 11 or 10 or something. Oh, okay. yeah. But, but you need to check that because I'm just, I'm kind of tired and I haven't had <laughs> enough coffee. <laughs> so, but it, it's, it's set by the registrar. It's available on Orion and also Coursebook. Okay. <clears throat> so we're in section 4.1. linear functions and we've already talked about lines so this is going to be a lot like that so so there's going to be um, it a lot of it's going to feel like we already talked about that this and that's true we're just talking about it in the context of functions and, and in slightly more depth Okay, so definition. A linear function is any function of the form f of x is mx plus b. where m and b are constants. So m, we have a name for this. What's the name for m? Slope. And b, we also have a name for b. What's b's name? The y-intercept. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're going to enumerate some possibilities. <clears throat> so here's three possibilities. So where slope is concerned, So we're going to point out three possibilities for slope. So m could be negative, m could be 0, m could be positive. Oops. A 
Okay. So how will how will uh, a line with negative slope look? It'll be going down, which is to say that if you were drawing it, as you move to your, your hand to the right, your hand must also be moving down. Okay? So then... <clears throat> Something like this. Okay. So that's what negative slope looks like. How about zero slope? How will that look? Horizontal. Which is to say that as you move your hand to the right, your hand should, should not be moving up, it should not be moving down. It should be staying at the exact level that it started at. Okay, and then the last possibility? Correct. As you move your hand to the right, your hand should also be moving up. Okay, any question about that? Okay, concerning the y-intercept. So in the first place, why the name y-intercept? Right, the, the, this word intercept in this um, context is related to touching, which is to say Here's, the, here's a red line. Where is it going to be touching the y-axis? Where is it going to be touching the y-axis? So again, we'll consider the, the same or the analogous possibilities that B could be negative, B could be 0, and B could be positive. <coughs> okay. Okay. So what must be true about a line with negative y-intercept? Right. Below the origin. So that is to say that this point here is below the origin. Now, that, the particular line that I happen to draw, does it have positive slope or negative slope? Negative. negative slope. Does that mean that every time that you have a negative y-intercept that you have negative slope? No. So can, can you imagine a, a line going through that point that in fact has positive slope? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, what does it mean when b is 0? Right, it, it must pass through the origin. And then, what if B is positive? above the origin. Okay, so any question about this page? Okay. <coughs> So, <clears throat> concerning those possibilities, I want you to draw every possible combination 
That is to say, here is where m is negative, here is where m is 0, and here is where m is positive. This is where b is negative, b is 0, and b is positive. So all the combinations. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to do it by dealing with the B's first, because B's telling me a point that must be on the line, specific point. Okay, so the fact that B is negative means that I need to select a point that is on the y-axis and also below the origin for everything in this row. So here we go. Okay, what analogous thing must be true about this row, about the next row? It has to be, go through the origin. And then what analogous thing is true about the bottom row? It has to be above. Okay, any question about me selecting those points? Okay, now I'll do... I did it by rows, now I'm going to do it by columns. So in the left column, what do I need, what do I need to do? Negative slope, and also it has to go through the point that I already drew. All right. So What needs to be true about the middle column? Very good. And then usually in a case like this where I can't draw directly on top of that one, I draw it just barely above it so that you can still see it. But do understand that, that's, that they're on top of each other. Okay, and then in the right column? Right, a positive least sloping line going through the point we already selected. Okay. So any question about these? <coughs> so now, if I was to just draw one for you, even, and even if I didn't give you a scale, that is to say, I didn't, put, I didn't put tick marks on it. I should still be able to ask you and say, well, is the, is the y-intercept negative, zero, or positive? And I should be able to ask you, is the slope negative, zero, or positive? Good. <clears throat> Any question about this? OK. <clears throat> So suppose I give you this uh, prompt. Find a linear find a linear function uh, L.
through points 3, negative 2, and 8, 1. Okay. So what do you think? It has a positive slope and a negative y. Well, maybe. I, I don't know. <laughs> but... Okay, well, we're going to do a plotting thing, but I want to do this entirely without uh, plotting. Y2 minus y1 over okay, good. So then, whenever, whenever you're requested to find a line, you're always looking for exactly two things. A point that's on the line and the slope of the line in question. You're always looking for these things. Okay, so then, do we know a point that's on the line? Yes. Yeah, we know two, so that's, so that's covered. What we need is a slope. So the slope well delta x, the change in x, x2 minus x1, which is to say we could take this x minus that x. You could have done it in the other order. That would be just fine. Uh, that is uh, 8 minus 3, which is 5. And then delta y, well, that'd be y2 minus y1. So what is y2? 1. 1. And then minus negative 2. Now. You could, have done, you could have done this subtraction in the other order. But both of these must be done in the same order, which is to say that if you did this one, x2 minus x1, then this one must be y2 minus y1. But you could have done x1 minus x2, and then this one would have needed to be y1 minus y2. Okay, so then this delta y is 3. So that's the change in x, that's the change in y. So what's the slope? three-fifths. Okay. So then a point. What point are we supposed to use? But, the, but we're given two. The easiest one. Right. It cannot matter which one you use. It cannot matter. So then, uh, because it cannot matter, you should it's it's arbitrary. Okay, so then select the one that's most expedient. So I'm going to select the one with no negatives in it. But you you should if you're curious or not sure, you should verify that this is in fact true by just redoing this exercise with the other point. Okay, then we'll now use the point slope formula y minus y1 is m x minus x1. So in these, these various bits are routed in this way. So this one to here, this one to here. And that one to there. <coughs> And now it's just a matter of plugging things in. So this, this equation is called the point-slope equation for a line um, because, it, because it has a point and a slope. <laughs> and it's something that you're expected to memorize. So this would be y minus 1 is 3 fifths x minus 8. So have we answered the question then? No, not yet because the question was find a linear function L that passes through these points. So 
So what now? Okay, distribute the three-fifths multiplication. So three-fifths x minus 24 fifths. Now, add one, okay. So three-fifths x. So this is five-fifths, and I'm adding it to that side, so that's 24 fifths, negative 24 fifths plus five-fifths is negative 19 fifths. Now what? Not quite. It's not that. Find a linear function. So this is this is an equation. This isn't a function. And the name and the, the linear function has a name. What's its name supposed to be? L. <laughs> so the answer is L of X is this thing. Any question about this one? <coughs> okay. <coughs> so we could do it slightly differently. So I could ask some qualitative questions first. And supposing that you can't even see the grid in the background, I could ask <coughs> about the slope. Is the slope, is the slope negative, zero, or positive? It's negative. Why is it negative? Correct. So it's always, it's always reckoned moving to the right. So as you move your pin to the right to stay on the line, you must move down. So that means the slope is negative. So the slope is negative. Qualitatively, I could also ask, how about the y-intercept? Is the y-intercept negative, zero, or positive? It's positive. Why is the y-intercept positive? <coughs> right, so the y-intercept is where the line touches the y-axis. So that's this point right here. Once you've identified that point, the question is, is it above, below, or touching the origin? So it's above. So it's the y-intercept is positive. Okay. Then I could ask, okay, well, suppose that this is um, suppose that this is the plot of linear function k. Find the formula for linear function k. So how do we do it? Right. So then we could we could read for, for example, we could read these coordinates off. For example, that's the coordinate 2, 1, and that's the coordinate whatever, whatever. Then if we were to write those down, then this would be exactly the same exercise as the previous one, but with different numbers. Okay, it'd be exactly the same. But instead of doing that, I'm going to do s just a very slight variation on that. And I'm going to read just one of the points. I'm going to read this one. So this is the point 2, 1. And then instead of reading the other coordinate, 
and dealing with that, I'm just gonna I'm gonna count uh, these. So I can see that this is one, two, three, four, five, six. So what what is so what does that tell me? That's the change in x. So delta x is what? Six. Okay, and then if I count this one, two, what does that tell me? That's not quite right. So delta y is two. So, so why is that not right? Because we're moving down. Delta y is negative two. So that means that the slope is what? Negative a third. Now I'd like to point out on a question such as this, on a question such as this, if student was to, was to do the following, if student was to look at this <laughs> and then say slope is negative, okay, and then, and then make the following error as if those weren't there and write down that the slope is one third, that's more than a little error. That's a big error. That's a, what, that, what that displays to the grader is that that is, that is um, a potential disconnect between the analytic understanding, that is to say the writing and the equations understanding versus the geometric, that is to say the visual understanding. Right, geometrically, this line clearly has negative slope. Okay. So then now that you have this, we could do the exact same thing before. So y minus uh, y1 is m x minus x1. And we can route the various bits to where they go. So y minus 1 is negative 1 third x minus 2. So y minus 1 is negative one third x plus two thirds. And then I'll add one to both sides, but one is three thirds, and two thirds plus three thirds is five of those thirds. So negative third x, and then plus five thirds. And so k of x is now let's say that I made a let's say that I made a algebraic error and I said negative one third x and then minus five thirds. So if this was if this was all that there was to the exercise, just just that bit, if it was just an analytic thing, then this would be more or less a completely forgivable arithmetic error, like maybe 1 out of 10 or 0 out of 10. Maybe me just saying, no, you, you know, a cosmic ray passed through your brain at that instant and got you, right? But on this exercise, it's a big deal. Why is it a big deal on this exercise? R cor correct. So consider this y-intercept. The y-intercept indicated by this is saying that the y-intercept should be below touching or above the origin. This is saying below the origin. And that is evidently not the case in the picture. Okay, so does everybody see the, the distinction? Okay. <coughs> so plus. Any question about this one? <coughs> okay. So next. <coughs> <clears throat> Here's an example. So I'm going to read something out loud. And then I'm going to write down the, the relevant things. So for a moment, I'm just going to read, read this, this story. Okay. <clears throat> Suppose that Ben starts a company in which he incurs a fixed cost of... 1250 per month for overhead, which includes rent. So just, just the privilege of having exclusive access to the building, even if he did nothing whatsoever with the building, costs 
$1,250. Uh, the production cost is $37.50 per item. Write a linear cost function, C of X, where X is the cost for X items produced in a month. Okay. So, <coughs> so the relevant bits of the story is that the fixed cost is one, two, what was it? Five, zero per month. And you can think of this like rent. Okay, and then the cost per <coughs> item to produce or item produced is probably better. This is uh, 3750. So by the way, those of you who have taken a business course or an economics course, what is what is the name for this? Marginal. The marginal cost. Okay, so that's not I don't I don't care about you 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 knowing that for this class, but it may soon become relevant to you. This is called the marginal cost. Okay, so then supposing uh, I want you to find the cost function C of X for X items produced. Well, what is it? Yes. So, yes, yeah, C of X is this thing. So C of X is, and then for, for various reasons that are not in, entirely relevant, frequently, but not always, they're, they're, the terms are written in the opposite order. So in the first place, what if I just left it here? What if I wrote nothing more? Then what would this mean about the cost? Yeah, it would mean that no matter what, the cost is 1250, 1250. Is that is that what the story says that uh, under under every circumstance the cost is 1250? No. No, right? It says that it says that um, for example, what would be the cost if you produced exactly one item? Right, it would be this rent plus the cost of producing exactly one. And then what would be the cost of producing 10 such items? 1250 plus 379. Times, yeah, okay, right. So 1250, the rent, <laughs> plus the cost of producing 10 such items. So this would be plus, generally, 37.5x. So if you produced a million items, okay, it'd be 1,250 plus a lot, right? And, and, and then at, at that point, the, the fixed cost associated with the business would be essentially negligible, right? Can you imagine if, 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 you, <laughs> if you had $37.5 million in, in cost, but your fixed cost was only 1,250? At that point, if your business is still running, you're probably making enough money to own the building. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> that's, a, that's a rounding error, uh, if that was the case. <clears throat> so, how about... Uh, suppose... <clears throat> suppose that... Uh, 100 items... Items... Are produced. 
please find the cost. Okay, how did you do that? I just plugged in an 100 part. Oh wait, is that 100? 100. And then the zero says Okay, so then what I'm asking for is I'm asking you to evaluate, evaluate C of X at, man, I'm having trouble writing right now, evaluate evaluate C of X at X is 100. That's what's being requested. Okay, <clears throat> so that would be C of 100 is 1250 plus 37.5 times 100. And I can do that without my calculator, right? Multiplying by 100 moves the decimal place two positions to the right. So 1250 plus 3750, and that's 5,000. Okay, so three, suppose the cost is 2825. <clears throat> Find the number of items produced. So now, what is it that I'm asking? Yeah. <laughs> so, so given, so to say it in, in math language, given C of X is 2825, find X. So does everybody understand how? Is it going to be a whole number? It should be. Unless I type something wrong in my calculator. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, 1250 plus 37.5x is 2825. So now what? So then 37.5x is 1575. And then what? Divide by 37.5, and what's that? 42. 42. <laughs> I think it works. Right? No, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Other questions? <laughs> Okay, good. So now, concerning cost functions, uh, generally speaking, generally speaking, the y-intercept of a cost function is positive. Okay, because that means that you, you actually have some cost, some fixed cost, like rent. So what would, if, if I gave you a cost function, what would it mean if the y-intercept was zero? You have, no, you have no fixed cost, no overhead whatsoever. That's nice. What if your y-intercept is negative? No, it means they, it's, they you're being, being paid so, yeah. to, to produce these things. Yeah, it means you're that... Some sort of contract, you're a good deal. Yeah, it means that no matter what, for some reason, even if you produce zero items, okay. you have a negative cost, which means that you have a profit. You're profiting even off of zero items. So I could turn the, the thing around and say the, the, the profit function. Profit functions, generally speaking, generally speaking, have a, have a negative y-intercept. 
And the reason is because, because if you produce no items and you're still paying your fixed cost, then you're losing money. If you're not selling stuff, you're losing money. If you have, if your profit function has, if it has a zero y-intercept, that means that your business is such that if you do, no, if you do nothing, then you make nothing, but you also lose nothing. If you have a positive y-intercept for your profit function, that means that you profit even if, even if you don't make anything. And you might think, ha, such businesses don't exist. And you would be wrong, because lots of them do. They don't exist for the long term and not without, not without um, basically legislation that legislates them into existence and into that position. So for example, in the United States, we pay a lot of farmers not to farm. Okay, so then, you know, th what that does, so not, not getting into, into policy of whether or not this is good policy, but at any rate, what that does is that keeps, for example, the market being entirely flooded with corn. Okay, because we pay all those people not to, not to paint, not to farm any corn. Yes, we know that you would farm some corn, but we're gonna pay you not to farm any corn. And then they say, well, I, I did not farm 100,000 tons of corn this year. So I need you to pay me for that. Okay, good. <clears throat> Oh, whatever, I have no idea how much people farm corn, to be honest with you. Okay, <clears throat> so another thing that we need to talk about we need to talk about parallel and perpendicular. So in the first case, parallel. <clears throat> so parallel lines means that you have lines that are running side by side. Okay, they never, they never veer away from each other or toward each other for that matter. So <clears throat> I'm gonna break the possibilities into two groups. So here's a line. So can someone in sort of plain language say what, what a parallel line might look like? Okay. So how about this red line? Is it parallel to itself? Yes. Lines are, are always self-parallel. Okay, but a, a, another parallel line would be something like this. So if I call this one G, I could call this one F. Okay. So <clears throat> supposing, so the, the, this is what parallel looks like. Supposing that F of X is the linear function m1x plus b1 and that g of x is m2x plus b2. Supposing that's the case, then we know something about the m's and, the, and maybe the b's. So what do we know about the m's? They must be the same. In order to be parallel, it must be the case that m1 is m2. That is to say that they have the same slope. Do we know anything about the b's? No, we don't know anything about the b's. The only thing that we can be sure about for the b's is that the b for f is bigger than the b for g, <laughs> according to the way I drew it, right? And yeah, F's B is positive, G's, G's B is negative. Okay, there's actually another possibility besides having the same slope for lines to be parallel. What's the other possibility? Right.
They could be both vertical. Because vertical lines, the slope of vertical lines is undefined. Okay. So that's parallel. So two perpendicular. And by the way, the, these ones are not functions, right? <laughs> Why are they not functions? They don't pass the vertical line test. They don't pass the vertical line test. Okay. So perpendicular. So parallel lines are lines that, if they're not the same line, they run side by side and never meet. So what about perpendicular lines? And moreover, at a 90 degree angle, at a right angle. Okay, so then this could be F. And if I was to say that this is a point that G goes through. G goes through that point, and also it is perpendicular to F. Then can you see how G must look? So if I say that G is perpendicular and goes through that point, then it must be the case that G looks like this. So if, again, F is M1X plus B1 and G is M2X plus B2, then there is a relationship between the slopes. So the, the relationship is slightly more complicated than parallel. Parallel is that the slopes must be exactly the same. So what is the relationship? Almost. That's the same thing as reciprocal. So so look, let this is this is. Do you agree? What what is the slope of of f? Is it positive, negative, or zero? The slope of f is positive. What if, you, what if you computed the reciprocal of a positive number? Is it still positive? Well, what, for example, if this is 2 thirds, what's the reciprocal of 2 thirds? 3 halves, which is still positive. So it's a negative. Negative reciprocal. So M1 is negative 1 over M2. This is the way it's written in your textbook, but if you go far enough in math, then it stops being written like that and it starts being written like this, that the product of the slopes is negative one, which is the same as this one. So slopes must be negative reciprocals of each other. But there's even another possibility. There's, a, there's another way for, for lines to be perpendicular to each other. Yes. That is to say that one of them has slope zero and the other one does not have slope. I can't write G because it's not a function. Okay, so then the way that this gets contextualized into an exercise is I'll say, you know, I'm thinking of a line, <laughs> and then I'll describe it. So what, is, what are you always looking for when I ask you to find a line? Point and slope. Point and a slope. So every single one of those exercises, one way or another, I've hidden a point, I've hidden a slope, and it is your task to find them, and then to assemble them into a line. Have a nice Monday.